Hello friends and welcome to my channel. I'm Lydia, the Halfling Seamstress. In this video, I'm hopping on a trend a few months late and joining the American Duchess Cape Cult. Perhaps some context. American Duchess is a company that specializes in absolutely gorgeous reproduction historical shoes. Case in point, they also make books and patterns on recreating historical dress. Last year, they posted a free pattern of a 1910s wrap cape that took the historical costuming community by storm. Instagram blew up with pictures of people creating this wonderfully unique cape, and the hashtag AD cape cult was born. When it comes to trends, I tend to be woefully behind, if I follow them at all. But this one, I got behind wholeheartedly, and set to work on making my own historical swooshy wrap cape. The pattern comes gridded, which you can either size up on your computer and print off, or manually draft using graph paper, or the wrapping paper with one inch markings. I chose the former, as I had not attempted drafting a pattern like this before, especially one with curves. This pattern only comes in one size, and they highly recommend doing a mock-up, especially if you're on the bustier side. I did make a mock-up, which I will not be showing the process of, as I made it while sick in bed. Suffice it to say, it fit pretty well all around, which was pleasantly surprising, but I did need to add a couple inches to the front wraparound piece. The pattern also does not come with seam allowance built in, so that needs to be taken into account when cutting out the fabric. I cut all my pieces with a half inch seam allowance. The front wrap pieces have three long darts, which is what gives it that nice, tailored, sleek look. I marked them out with carbon paper, and since it really did not show up well on wool, I went over them again with chalk. And then the whole process is repeated with the pattern flipped over to make the other half of the wrap. Then the sleeve pieces get cut out. They're not sleeves in the traditional sense, but they are pieces that go over your arms, so sleeves it is. It's also really important to include any balance marks, as they are essential for correctly matching the pieces together later on. For some reason I didn't get any footage of it, but there is also a back piece that the front wraps and sleeves attach to. Now I noticed that with handling, the chalk marks were beginning to fade from the wool, so I thread marked all my seams, darts, and balance marks. This is just done with a running stitch, and will be pulled out after everything's seamed together. I also did the same with the blue linen I used for the lining. The chalk and carbon paper marks do stay better on linen than wool, but I wanted to be sure I didn't lose anything. It takes a bit longer this way, but it adds a bit of peace of mind. It's also good practice for keeping your stitches straight. Now to the construction. First off are the darts. If you've never done darts before, you're definitely going to be getting your practice in with this project. Between the outer fabric and lining, there are a total of 12 darts in all. I found them to be the most challenging part of this whole cape. But the nice thing is, once you've finished them, it's smooth sailing for the rest of the way. The thread marking was also quite helpful in lining up the dart edges. Once all the darts are stitched in place, the excess fabric gets cut away to reduce bulk. It then gets lightly misted, this is especially effective on linen, and ironed down. Now the front wrap pieces get stitched to the back at the shoulders. Once the back and front pieces are attached, it's time to add the sleeves. I found these a little bit tricky, and needed a fair bit of focus when putting them in. Curves are so not my forte, and I will spare you all the footage of me wrangling everything to make sure it was sitting smoothly as I sewed. And then everything you saw done with the blue lining also gets done to the outer fabric as well. Now it's time to move on to the collar. The first piece is the contrast fabric. The top and side edges get pressed and basted down, and will be sewn on to the main collar piece right side facing up. It then gets centered and pinned to the right side of the collar fabric. To stitch down the contrast piece, I'm using a thick silk thread in a matching color. Yes, I know it says salmon. Long story. I stitched the contrast piece on with a whip stitch, however, when it was done, I wasn't quite happy with how it sat just whipped down. I ended up going in with a different silk thread and top stitching it down by hand instead. It sits so much nicer that way. 
The collar pieces get pinned right sides facing each other and stitched together. It then gets turned right side out and pressed down. Just look at how nice and smooth that looks. To make the collar just a little bit more polished, I ran a narrow top stitch all around the three seamed sides. The collar then gets pinned to the center of the back. Do excuse me standing right in the light. I don't know where my brain was that day. The collar is sewn to the right side of the outer fabric, contrast fabric up. This was a confusing idea to me at first, particularly how it related to the lining, but it soon became clear how it was going to work. The pattern states that there are two methods of lining. One is where you put the two pieces on top of each other with the wrong sides together, turn the seam allowances under, and stitch them in by hand. The other is the more common modern method of lining, where you pin the right sides together, stitched all around by machine except for a small opening, and then turn everything right side out. I attempted the traditional method, but my materials refused to cooperate, so I went with the modern method I had done before. The key thing to remember when you're using the modern bag lining method is to make sure the collar is on the inside, sandwiched between the lining and outer fabric when you're stitching everything down. It may seem counterintuitive, but otherwise when you turn everything right side out, it will end up stuck inside, and you don't want that. Now everything gets a good press to smooth the fabric out and make it look pretty. You especially want to focus on the seams and make sure everything is pressed out as far as it can go. To help make it sit nice and neat, I top stitched around the entire cape. I was faced with a slight dilemma though. If I used black thread, it would show on the blue lining. If I used blue thread, it would show on the black wool. So with some quick thinking, I used my black bobbin and my blue spool. That way, there's blue thread on blue fabric and black thread on black fabric. When sewing the lining in, I left the ends of the wrap pieces open to add the fastenings. In the pattern, it says to use a hook and eye, but I wanted something a little more adjustable and accessible. So instead, I used two pieces of grosgrain ribbon. I tucked the ends of the wrap in, added the ribbon, and hand stitched everything into place. Now I have an awesome swooshy cape that instantly upgrades any outfit. I absolutely love this cape. It looks historical, fantastical, and a little bit sci-fi all at once. It took me about two days to sew, not counting the mock-up. Apart from the darts, it was fairly easy, although I don't think I'd recommend it for someone as a my first sewing project. The pattern recommends two to three yards of fabric, and either I'm very careful with my cutting, it's a generous estimate, or the fabric store I bought my wool from gave me more than three yards. Either way, I had enough black wool to make my cape, and enough left over to make a matching full-length history-bounding skirt. And did I mention it's also reversible? Oh yes, I also learned that if you're going to try and take a video on a windy day with a lightweight iPhone tripod, either ask for help or just don't. Cue the outtakes. 